even though it is the middle of September, I have decided it is just time to start with Halloween. And so I am making my Halloween quilt today. And I also made a solids version of this quilt, which is hanging behind me. And I think you guys are really gonna like this quilt. It's super easy. It takes just a bundle of fat quarters. There's no background, there's no muss, no fuss. You cut all your fat quarters the same way and then chain piece them together. I have already finished almost all the blocks for my Halloween version of this quilt. I have just uh, three fat quarters left to go. I have my pattern here with my cutting schematic. This is a free download from my website. The link will be in the description below. You do have to go through a short checkout process, but it's free. Um, and download it and print it out because this cutting schematic is really kind of the key to this whole pattern. So I wanted this quilt to be kind of fallish, kind of plaid, but um, easy. <laughs> So we are going to kind of stack our fat quarters and cut them all the same way and then just shuffle the layers to sew them back together. And that creates this nice kind of plaid effect. You can sort your fabrics in one of two ways. For my Halloween quilt, I wanted certain colors and certain prints to stay together. And so I cut them in sets of three or four and shuffled just these three together so that um, like this print will always be with this orange stripe. For my solids version back there, I actually cut all of my fat quarters, stacked them all up, and then I shuffled the layers so that the colors would be more evenly distributed. It's totally your choice, whichever look you're going for. Um, a little bit more controlled, a little bit more shuffled. Now I'm cutting my fat quarters, uh, there's a stack of three here, and I'm cutting them just according to the diagram in the pattern. Now you will need to cut across your fat quarters in two different directions. So if you have a large cutting mat that you can just rotate on your table, or if you like me, I have this cutting mat that I can kind of walk around the corner of. So that's what I'm doing. I'm cutting three layers, but if you are more comfortable only cutting one layer, then you can certainly do that and then just stack the small squares that you cut um, up into a larger pile. Do whatever's comfortable for you. Um, don't try to cut more layers than you feel like you can be accurate with. I cut my fabric using the lines on my mat. You do not have to do this. I know that not everybody agrees with my methods, but it's kind of just what I do. If you would prefer to use your ruler method, then by all means, use whatever system gives you the most accurate, best results. Once you have completed all of the cutting lines in the diagram, it is time to shuffle the layers of these three fat quarters. And that's what really kind of exposes the plaid look for these blocks. So I'm starting with the kind of stripes of our block. And in the pattern, these are the areas in the green on the kind of little diagram of the block. I'm taking the top layer, the little ghost fabric, and simply moving it to the bottom of the stack. And that exposes the second fabric, which is that orange stripe fabric. And then for the two kind of intersection areas, I'm taking the top two fabrics, so the ghost fabric and the orange fabric, and I'm moving both of those in order to the bottom of the stack. And that exposes that little green spider fabric. As long as you move the same number of fabrics to the bottom of the stack for each kind of category, the squares or the stripes, then you'll come out with a nice little plaid. Now that we have cut our fat quarters and shuffled the layers, it is time to chain piece our blocks. Now I have my set of three blocks here, but for the solids version, I had all 16 blocks piled up and I made them all at the same time. And it did go really quickly because chain piecing is magic. I only have these three left to do, so I'm gonna chain piece them as I normally do. I'm going to sew these seams pressing as I go and then returning them to the mat. And then I will add this last column and then I will sew the rows together. That is how I normally chain piece, but find a system that works for you that you can keep track of really easily and then just keep doing that the same way and then you won't ever lose your place. If you do have to step away or take a break or come back to it the next day, you'll kind of always know where you are. I'm gonna get chain piecing and I will meet you back when my blocks are done. So I have pieced all of my 
units into rows for my block. And this is a good place to just kind of pause and make sure that your block still looks the way it is supposed to and that your stacks are all kind of consistent. So I just wanna make sure that all of my background prints are on that top layer and all of my stripes match. So just take a moment and kind of flip through. You saw in the time lapse, I did actually get one row kind of mixed up and had to resort it. So this is a good time just to pause, double check, make sure your stack of chain piecing rows is still in the right order. And then we can assemble the rows into the final blocks. It's like five minutes later and remember how I was all like this is a great time to look at your stacks and make sure that they're all in the right order definitely do that because I just sewed two incorrect pieces together and I knew this because I went to pick up my next two pieces two rows that should be joined and they were the same fabrics so I knew something was wrong so now I'm ripping these two rows apart and then I'm gonna take another minute and make sure that my stacks are all correct. This is the one that when I was chain piecing, I just pressed in the wrong order. So I'm not terribly surprised, but ripping's no fun. I don't enjoy this. So I have completed all of my blocks. I have all 16 blocks here and they are pressed and ready to assemble. I'll be following the diagram in the PDF pattern for the layout of the quilt top. It is just four rows of four blocks each and all of the blocks are oriented the same way so that those vertical and horizontal lines that we made in our blocks all line up and go across the quilt top. I'm going to distribute my colors as best as I can, and when I return, we will have a completed quilt top and we will be ready to talk about quilting ideas. It's time to quilt these quilts. Now I have these two versions of this quilt top to quilt, and the one that I pieced in this video earlier was uh, kind of loud. It's the Halloween version, and these prints are fun and bright and busy and so I think that I am going to take a little bit of shortcut with the quilting here and do an all over pantograph for this quilt. I like to try to balance the quilting with the ultimate payoff for the quilting and so I tend to when the quilt is super busy like this especially like a scrappy quilt or a quilt with really loud prints I think it's just an easy way to finish it to do an all over quilting kind of design rather than spend a lot of time doing a custom quilt job that no one will really appreciate. <laughs> so um, I have a pantograph with some bats all over it that I think will be perfect for this Halloween quilt. I chose to quilt this Halloween quilt with some black thread and I used that grunge dots uh, backing in black as well. I had a lot of fun using this paper pantograph for this quilt. It was kind of really nice to just kind of put my headphones on and let the little paper design tell me where to quilt. I think that the bats turned out really cute and overall I'm really happy that I went this direction with this quilt. It uh, is definitely a little bit outside of my usual design, but I can see myself doing more pantographs in the future. When it came to quilt the solids version of this plaid quilt, I chose to do just a simple continuous curve design. I had originally planned something a lot more elaborate, but I had this kind of delicious puffy wool batting to use, and it just seemed like the perfect combination of minimal quilting to allow that puff of the wool to really shine. I used two rulers to create this effect. I used a longer kind of shallow curve ruler for most of the quilting, but for the shorter seams, the ones that are kind of on the um, edges of the narrow rectangles and the center squares, I used a smaller curve that has a little bit more more height to it so that the curve would actually show up. I tried using the same ruler and it was just kind of like stitching it in the ditch. There wasn't enough kind of definition of the curve. 
I backed this quilt in peppered cotton, which is one of my favorite backings. It's so soft, and um, I think the colors kind of add a lot of depth to a solids quilt doesn't always have like a lot of dimension. So I think adding that peppered cotton on the back really kind of added a little bit of interest. I ended up binding this quilt in pickle, and I also used a pickle colored thread to quilt it. And um, pickle is obviously my favorite Kona color, so I was thrilled that it was included in this bundle that I used to create the top so that I could use it in the binding. To create this design in a continuous way, I worked across kind of three sides of each square or box in my piecing, and then I did another pass to close off those boxes where I just kind of curved across the bottom of each of the boxes all the way across. If you are working on a domestic machine, then you can work in the exact same way. You can do um, little clusters of a few boxes at a time, or you can orient the quilt kind of in the way that it looks in the video here, where you're working kind of towards and away from yourself instead of um, across like I do on the long arm. And that will allow you just to kind of roll up the excess material on the sides of the quilt and work kind of in a manageable column, almost like you would if you were doing just straight line quilting with a walking foot, except there's kind of this curvy element to it. But it makes it a much more manageable quilting experience than um, having the entire bulk of the quilt kind of exposed and needing to be shifted around. So with that, my quilts are both done. I really enjoyed making this Halloween quilt. I think that the prints were a lot of fun and really festive, and using a pantograph on really busy prints like this was perfect, because although I really love busy prints and I love custom quilting, they don't always go together very well, because you just really can't see thread lines on busy prints. And so using a pantograph here was perfection. In the solids version, I'm so happy I went with minimal quilting and that puffy wool quilter's dream batting. Uh, I think the combination is just going to be really cozy as we head into fall, and uh, my son has already kind of claimed this quilt, so I don't know how much of it I'm going to see. I did actually manage to label both of these quilts, which I wish that I was doing with every quilt, but I have let slide a little bit lately. So I was really happy that I got both labels attached uh, right after binding them. I hope you guys enjoyed this pattern. It is, again, a free download on my website. You um, can just click on the description below this video and it will pop out with lots of information about the fabric I used and um, where to go to download the pattern. I hope you guys enjoy this. It just takes 16 fat quarters, no background fabric or anything. So it was really easy to just grab a bundle from my shelf and get cutting right away. If you guys did like this pattern, then there are many other fat quarter patterns on my channel, and I will link to the fat quarter playlist that is popping up on the screen right now. And there is also another video popping up on the screen that YouTube thinks that you will love. I will be back in two weeks with another quilt tutorial, and I can't wait to see you. I think that this is a really fun quilt that's coming up. And in the meantime, happy quilting. Now that I've been recording the whole time. Awesome. No.